Well, morning, everyone. Uh, might as well get started. Welcome to the next installment of the JKMRC Friday morning seminar series that take place here at the Indoor Pili Lecture Theater and online as well. My name is Katarina and Karina and myself are the co-chairs of the seminar series and are taking turns introducing the speakers and, and organizing the, the series this year. On behalf of the University of Queensland and the Sustainable Minerals Institute, we'd like to respectfully acknowledge all traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet today. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognize our valuable contributions to Australian and global society. So our speaker today is Dr. Patrick Heyman from the Queensland University of Technology, where he is a senior lecturer. Pat's research interests are in developing more sustainable and efficient models for mineral systems exploration at the regional to local scales, using his expertise in um, physical volcanology. So upon completion, completion of bachelor's degree at Queen's University, which is my university as well, and master's at the University of British Columbia, Pat worked for several diamond exploration and mining companies in Canada before moving to Australia to obtain his PhD degree at Monash. So Monash Mafia, there you go. <laughs> he held a three year research fellowship at Monash, working on regional um, volcanostratigraphic and structural problems in the Yule Garden in Western Australia before moving to sunny and sometimes wet Queensland. His current active uh, research is in both Western Australia for gold and in Queensland for lithium. And today's presentation is on, oh, okay, a mouthful, differentiated Archean dolerites, igneous and emplacement processes that enhance prospectivity for orogenic gold. Welcome, Pat. <laughs> Thank you. I hope my microphone is on. Everyone can hear me. Well, thank you for inviting me, uh, Katerina and Karina. It's a pleasure to come all the way here and uh, present this research. Um, I know the audience is quite varied. So it's a very geology-heavy talk. I'm sorry I couldn't incorporate a lot of uh, other aspects. But um, so uh, Katerina's already presented the title. There are a number of uh, other people I'd like to acknowledge. A lot of what I'm going to present today comes from a paper that we published last year in Economic Geology, and some of the earlier ideas were published a couple of years uh, before that as well in Precambrian Research. The research couldn't have happened without a number of industry sponsors, so they're acknowledged here as well. I'm just going to get on with the talk. Press here. Okay. So what is a differentiated dolerite? Well, uh, it's a mafic sill, and the best places to study them would probably be in Antarctica. This is the Farrar dolerite. It's a Jurassic sill that formed during the breakup of Australia and Antarctica. And it's this tabular body there. It's about 200 meters thick. And on first order, these sills are tabular uh, sheet-like sheet -like bodies. But they're certainly more complex than that. This is still the Farrar dolerite. And you can see that there are places where the sill has little fingers that come down. And in places where maybe rafts of sediment, this is the, um, these are, uh, gosh, I can't remember the name of the sediments, but they, you can see rafts of them are getting included into that sill. So it's, you know, on first order there, tabular. Uh, bodies, but they're more complex in detail, for sure. And great to touch this high tech. Uh, yeah, maybe maybe a little bit higher. Oh, really higher? Yeah. But you know if that's better. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, this is a recent study. In East Greenland, using LIDAR from a helicopter. And this is outlining, showing you very clearly some complexities, other complexities in sills, particularly with the fingering and including of rafts. Um, so, <clears throat> with these new technologies, we're starting to see that um, you know, there's a lot more complexity than, than on first order. <clears throat> 
uh, similar features there. Another uh, relatively new advancement is in improved imaging with seismics. These are two studies in modern basins, one in the North Sea at the, at, uh, the bottom and in the Bight Basin just off uh, South Australia in the top. And there what you can see is these saucer-shaped forms of the sills. So as they um, uh, get further from their source, they tend to turn up at the edges and form these saucer-shaped features. And here they're imaging sort of the interconnectivity of these saucers, which is kind of interesting. So these new technologies are giving a better understanding of the geometry of these sills. This study I think is just incredible. This is in uh, uh, the Northern Sea off Scotland. And what they're imaging through here with seismics is the surface of the sill. It looks exactly like a lava flow. This is a sill intruding through sediments, unconsolidated sediments, but it looks like a lava flow. You can see these fingers, these fingers up here. Um, so you're getting these different lobes and fingers. It's really incredible just being able to see that kind of detail. And it's a similar story in the, in the Bight Basin as well. You're seeing on the right there. So these new technologies are allowing us to understand the geometry. The other thing that I should mention is it's giving us um, ideas of how the host rocks are controlling the geometry and the character of these sills. Another thing I'd like to point out, um, we're in an unprecedented period <clears throat> where the amount of data we have is just incredible, particularly geochemistry, which is really helpful for understanding these sills, um, and thermodynamic modeling. I use a lot of this program called PMELTS. In the past, so this is uh, uh, Bowen and Bowen's reaction series. A lot of the <clears throat> sort of first order fractionation processes that happen in these sills were predicted by Bowen more than 100 years ago. But the point I'm making here is we have lots more data and improved uh, techniques, the thermodynamic modeling, that allows us to interrogate this a lot further. OK, so that's a bit about why we can learn more about differentiated dolerites now. Why there's interest in differentiated dolerites, particularly the Archean ones, is that they host gold. Here's a table um, of differentiated dolerites that host gold. Most of them you'll see are in Australia. Uh, there are a few in Canada. I'm sure they're in other countries. They just haven't been identified as differentiated dolerites. You can see on the right there, that's all the gold in the US government reserves. If we look at the top uh, gold hosting differentiated dolerite, the golden mile dolerite, I'm gonna stop pressing that button and use, that's how much gold has come out of the golden mile dolerite. So these are important uh, hosts of gold. Okay, an important point to get across is that the gold is not related to the emplacement, it doesn't happen at the same time as emplacement of the differentiated dolerite. It comes in 10, 20, uh, you know, tens of millions of years later during a mountain building event. This gold is orogenic gold. And what we know about orogenic gold is that deep in the crust, probably because of devolatization reactions during metamorphism, that fluid picks up the gold and transports it up to shallower levels. But the key here with the differentiated dolerite is that there's portions of the differentiated dolerite that contain a lot of magnetite. And when those gold fluids touch that magnetite, the gold gets precipitated. And from that point of view, it's really important to understand the igneous and emplacement processes of dolerites if you want to understand the potential of a dolerite to host gold. I was very pleased when I started thinking about this because orogenic gold is largely the domain of structural geologists. And here's a, an aspect that really needs a more uh, igneous uh, petrology slant. How can we get more uh, magnetite formed in these sills? is really the crux. Okay, so one of the really annoying things when you look through the literature is that differentiated dolerites, the internal character, 
is described in many different ways. And it's regional as well as uh, age. So Archean sills are described differently compared to more modern mafic sills. And then the Canadians and the Australians have also diverged in terms of their nomenclature. I won't go through it all, but I think it's important that I give uh, credit to Travis in this, in this column here. It was really the first one to recognize in the Golden Mile Dolerite that it was a differentiated sill, that these different rock types were related to fractionation, that they weren't, because previously they were all considered different rock types and the history and relation between them was really unclear. But uh, Travis was really seminal in piecing that together. Um, and um, so the column on the left in color, that's something we published a couple of years ago. And you can see the uh, asymmetry in it. That's on account of fractionation. I'll just go through that in a bit more detail quickly. So this is the general character of a differentiated dolerite. These sills are on average about 200 meters thick. And the tops and the bottom are made up of very fine grained uh, mafic rock. We use the textural term basalt um, for anything with a ground, grain size less than one millimeter. And you can see here's the basalt, it's aphiric, and it's uh, in contact with the host, with the host mudstone there. So you find that at the tops and the bottoms. As you go in, you find coarser grains, and that's just because it's cooled more slowly. We use the textural term dolerite uh, and gabbro, although I should point out the term dolerite is used very widely and non-discriminately in the Yilgarn. Uh, it really doesn't have any relation to grain size other than it being coarse grained, and often it ha is not related to the grain, uh, to the mineralogy. We're using it in a more restrictive sense, dolerite for anything between one and two, gabbro for anything greater than two, made up of mafic minerals. Um, So one of the points of going through this is I've tried to remove the uh, subjectivity of a lot of the previous nomenclature systems to try and simplify and make it based on hand sample characteristics. One of the aspects of Travis's first, um, his internal subdivisions requires thin sections, which is you know, a whole nother complication. So we've tried to remove that uh, element. Up towards the top of a differentiated dolerite, you often find uh, quartz dolerites or quartz gabbros, depending on the grain size. And you can see I've pointed out where some of the quartz is. And these are typically also associated with magnetite. Uh, on the right here, you can see here's quartz intergrown with, with feldspars and magnetite in here, the opaque minerals. Towards the bottom, you find peroxinites. The other thing I should say, these rocks are green schist facies, so they're not um, pristine uh, in their mineralogy. So you're gonna be able to see through the alteration. Um, so that's clinopyroxene. In most cases, it's altered to amphibole and or chloride. And then you can find peridotites, very dark looking rocks. Of course, olivine uh, has a very poor preservation potential. It's usually altered to serpentine, um, but often you'll find secondary magnetite in this part of the um, in this part of the body and that's um, the alteration of olivine to serpentine in in many cases produces magnetite as well but that's a secondary magnetite it has a very different uh, morphology to the primary magnetite that you find in the quartz dolerites but again that's near the bottom <clears throat> and then the last rock type to point out are these granophyric veins <clears throat> and domains. Now, these are really fascinating parts of the, of the sill. You get these cross-cutting veins. Sometimes they're, in the literature, they can be called pegmatites or pegmatoids. Um, they have sharp contacts or <clears throat> um, in some cases, it's, it's not as if the rock has been broken, but mostly uh, solidified. They are made up of intergrown quartz and feldspar plus magnetite. So what we call granifier is this sort of texture here. It's the intergrown uh, texture of quartz and feldspar. And that relates to a late stage crystallization 
And on the right there, you can see the, the primary magnetite. That shape is very different to the magnetite you see in uh, secondary magnetite in peridotites. And this is a granophoric domain. Sometimes you find these little pods, but the veins are far more common. Okay, so we were working in Western Australia and we looked at a number of these dolerites marked out in, well, here we are in Western Australia, I should point out, uh, in the Yilgarn Craton. So a 10 hour drive east of Perth. And we looked at a number of dolerites in the yellow stars listed in this table here. Um, they come from a variety of levels in the stratigraphy, but the majority of them do come from, they intrude these uh, sediments higher up in the sequence. In general, they're about 2.7 billion years old, but um, some of them are 2.68, some are 2.72 uh, billion years old, but generally the same age range. This is all the sills we looked at. Now, in many cases, we looked at multiple drill holes through the same sill. Uh, in some cases, only one or two. And I've summarized each of these dolerites. Now there's internal variation at a local scale, but this is sort of represents the general character of the Golden Mile dolerite, of the Junction dolerite, et cetera, et cetera. And the reason I show this slide is really to highlight the differences. They're quite varied. When I first went through the sort of general character of a differentiated dolerite, that's the overall theme, but there's a lot of variation. First of all, what you can see, so they're all scaled to true thickness. You can see on the left there, zero to 200. So the Golden Mile dolerite's about 450 meters thick. It's the thickest. Junction dolerite's also quite thick. And then you can see there's some pretty measly looking ones on the right. Um, one of the first things that really jumps out is the salmon color domain on the sort of left, left five. That's the quartz dolerite. So some differentiated dolerites have really thick quartz dolerite domains. The ones on the right have hardly any. <clears throat> the ones on the right, however, seem to have quite thick cumulates. When I use cumulates, I'm talking about the peroxinites and the peridotites, olivine and pyroxene rich rocks. And that's in the, in the purples. The ones on the left generally don't have much, uh, have very thick or they have absent uh, cumulates here. They're quite small. Another thing to point out is, interestingly, some of them, I should explain, in terms of a stratigraphic log, the way I've drawn it here, the x-axis represents the average grain size. So when it comes out more to the right, it means it's a coarser grained rock. And for the most part, the golden mile dollar right down here is a gabbro, but then it gets very fine grain right in the middle. Some of them have basalt right in the middle. Golden Mile Dolerite has a very thick basalt domain, more than uh, 50 meters thick. And some of the other sills have basalt domains. And then you can also see the granophere veins here. In some sills, they're near the top, some they're near the middle, some don't really have any. So there's quite a variation. That's the main take home message. But the overall asymmetry is, is similar. Okay, so now we're gonna move into geochemistry. And what I've plotted here is uh, magnesium on the x-axis. That's a great way of uh, showing fractionation from the most uh, um, fractionated with low magnesium to more uh, the most fractionated to the least fractionated. They're colored by lithophases. So the the peridotites and the peroxinites plot on the right because they have high magnesium. They've got lots of olivines and pyroxenes. And then the granophoric domains and granophires plot, or the, the quartz dolerites in these sorts of colors plot on the left. Um, you can see there's sort of a nice trend here. Well, oh, there's something interesting going on in here. In terms of the AFM diagram, they plot along the foliatic series for the most part. Okay. In terms of rare earth element uh, plots, I really just show this because I think one would have the obvious question, well, are we comparing apples with apples if the geochemistry is quite different? What we find is the vast majority of these sills are foliates. They have these flat 
or relatively flat rare earth element patterns. That's what I've called group one. These are the foliates. The group two and the group three are quite different in terms of rare earth elements. I didn't study many of those sills, so I don't have that much to say about them. So a lot of the rest of the talk really is focusing on the foliates. And so I'll leave it at that. So, um, okay, so internally, how does the geochemistry vary? This is the golden mile dolerite. Remember, it's about 400 meters thick. And these are all different elements. I'm not going to go through all of them, but here in uh, the black dots, that's the magnetic susceptibility. And that's, of course, going to highlight minerals like magnetite. And you can see that it has relatively low magnetic susceptibility. And then, bam, magnetite crystallization, and it jumps up hugely. And interestingly, that coincides with high iron, high vanadium, high titanium. You can see this sort of bulge in this part of the diagram. Those are titanomagnetites that are crystallizing. So you can really track the mineralogy with the geochemistry. Another thing to point out here is the red here, that's zirconium. And the zirconium is very high and it correlates uh, more or less with the quartz dolerite. So the more evolved rocks have more zirconium. And that's because zirconium is a late crystallizing phase. So the last bits of melt that crystallize will have higher zirconium. And so that's a good way of tracking the most evolved portions of the sill. And I'll also point out magnesium and nickel, they're relatively constant, less than 10 weight percent and less than 200 ppm. That's, that's quite low. And I'm just gonna contrast that with the next one and just note this one doesn't have much of a, it has no cumulate at the bottom. When you look at this sill, which I chose deliberately because it doesn't have much quartz dolerite and has a thicker cumulate, there's some interesting variations. Well, first of all, there's not much change in the magnetite until you get to here. And there's hardly any blip in the iron and titanium. There's not very much titanomagnetite in the sill. In terms of zirconium, these are all scaled to the same, uh, you know, these are all the same scales. You can remember the golden mile dolerite had a big blip out here, hardly any zirconium. So it suggests there's not very much, um, there's not a lot of very evolved melt in this part of the sill. And then the magnesium is quite different. Here we're getting up to almost 15 weight percent, reflecting very high, uh, large volumes of cumulants. The other thing I forgot to mention here was, it's, it's a very interesting hole that I looked at because there were two big gaps in it. And those were old stopes uh, from uh, historic mining. And so the gold they were mining was here and up here, and then when you look at assay results, all the gold is up in this part of the sill. Um, there was hardly any gold in this one. Okay, so what naturally falls out are sort of two main end members here. These sills here, which have very thick quartz dolerites, that's the salmon, the salmon colored part. And these ones with very minimal quartz dolerites, just focus on the red, the zirconium. They have very big bulges in zirconium. They have a lot of the evolved component in them. Whereas these ones over here, very little. And then if you look at magnesium, for example, it's relatively minor. They're scaled to the same thing. You can see the bulges here are much bigger. And so there's a lot more cumulate and that's reflected in the, in the uh, major element content. So yeah, I can summarize the characteristics of these different sills, but these sort of two end member groups. But the key point I want to make is that four out of the five sills in that group on the left with thick quartz dolerites are past, present, or future. You know, they're trying to define a resource in them. Those ones on the right don't host any economic gold. And the one caveat I want to add here, or the important point I want to make, is I don't think I'm characterizing the whole sill in continuity, but at least locally, they're not economic, okay? But where you've got a lot of quartz dolerite, good potential for gold, where you don't, not so good potential. Oh, yes. Okay, so 
I'm going to focus on the group one sills and I'm going to get into some thermodynamic modeling. It's not, uh, don't be scared. It's not, not, not too heavy. So one of the things is I want to know what's the composition of these sills. I need to know what was the original melt composition. Now, because they're fractionated, of course, they've changed through, through time. Either they've lost crystals or gained crystals, depending on where they're in the sill. But there's one place where they haven't, and that's the chilled margin. That's the bit of the melt that when it first intruded into that rock, it crystallized quickly and formed a, a glass. And so it traps in its original composition. So if I want to know the melt, sample the chilled margin. And so that's an example here of a chilled margin collected up at the top of that sill. So that's what I'm using to understand what the original melt was of these sills. And one of the things that you find when you sample these chilled margins is that although these are all basaltic rocks, they're not primary melts that came from the magma. We know that because their magnesium is relatively low. The chilled margins haven't lost any crystals yet. They haven't fractionated at all, but their magnesium is only five or six weight percent. When you and, and the nickel and chromium are also low. These are all geochemical indicators. But they're not primary melts that have come directly from the mantle. If it was a primary melt, this is what the uh, people who work in this space think the original composition should, where it should plot in this iron versus ma magnesium number space. Okay, and none of them do, although some of them are quite close but not for the tholeites. The tholeites are these, these colors here. And so I did a bit of modeling to say, well, okay, let's start somewhere in that primary melt space in the mantle. How much do we have to fractionate? Well, I actually brought it up into the crust and said, how much do we have to fractionate in the deep crust before we can get into a space where the melt will look like the cave rocks or the bombora or the golden mile dolerite? And it doesn't really matter where you start here. You can move this around and I've even played a bit with pressure. And, but what it shows you is you need to fractionate a lot of clinopyroxene um, to get down into this space, up to 50% crystals of, of clinopyroxene. If you started further over here, you'd need to fractionate a bit of plage, but um, olivine's not that significant unless you started way over here to bring it back down here. But regardless of the scenario, you have to fractionate a large volume of crystals and mostly clinopyroxene. So if you want to produce a melt that's going to crystallize, if you want to uh, crystallize, a lot of magnetite, you need to fractionate about 50% crystals somewhere in, in the crust before bringing the melt up to shallower levels. A first fractionating event, okay? So that's what's happening deep in the crust before you bring the melt up to shallower levels. Now I'm thinking about shallower levels where we finally see these sills in place and we can roughly work out what sort of depths they're at because they're within basins. Um, so this melt mo melts modeling is uh, done at one kilobar. And the tholeites have very similar compositions. It didn't really matter which one I took, but you can see that um, as the magma cools, you crystallize clinopyroxene, plagioclase quickly comes on the liquidus. And then you can see when magnetite starts to form after about 50% crystallization, there's other things you can consider in terms of uh, density and how the composition changes through time. I won't say very much about that, but um, in terms of the order of crystallization, what I wanna do here is just show how beautifully this melts modeling uh, uh, captures what's happening in the data. So I've shown those geochemical points on the right before, they're just colored by the different rock types. The pinks and the purples are the cumulates and the red and the, and the, uh, the lighter pink, this one here. 
That's the granophyric veins and, and the reds are the quartz dolerites. I started with a chilled margin, which is the green. I think I've got a zoomed in picture here. And you can see as you fractionate, so with my melt, if I fractionate 20% crystals, 40%, 60%, it beautifully follows the trend in all sorts of different bivariate space. And the other great thing about melts is, be, remember I said these rocks are green schist facies. They don't have any primary crystals. I can't analyze a pyroxene and say what its composition. Well, melts tells me theoretically what their compositions should have been. And you can plot them in here and you can start doing some ternary uh, plotting to work out the relative proportions of those minerals in the rocks. But um, geochemically, what you can say is rocks with greater than weight eight weight percent magnesium are the cumulates. The ones that have less than six are the evolved ones, the quartz dolerites and the granophires and those in between and the green colors, those rocks haven't experienced very much in terms of uh, removal or addition of crystals. So I've been mentioning magnetite and its importance or titanomagnetite. The reason it's important is because uh, gold, which gets transported as a bisulfide ligand, when that comes in contact, it crystallizes uh, pyrite and the gold gets precipitated at the same time. This is uh, fairly well known. It's not something that I can show in the rocks easily. So I take it on, on faith, but I can show you the spatial association is, is quite clear. Gold is associated where the rocks have a lot of magnetite. So if you accept that, well, what is magnetite dependent on? Magma composition, water content, and oxygen fugacity. Um, and so it's important to think about what are the characteristics of a magma that would crystallize more magnetite. And really what it comes down to is the iron. More iron in a rock, the more magnetite you're gonna crystallize. Um, so, you know, I did lots of melts modeling, playing around with this with different oxygen fugacities and water content, but it does come down to the iron content. It's simply that. And that's what the, the graph on the right is showing. Okay, so I'm now getting into a bit more and thinking about the process of emplacement, uh, about sill emplacement. Now, we know these sills have fractionated. You see that asymmetry just looking at the different rock types. But so a thought experiment I had is, well, if all fractionation is vertical, in other words, gravity driven, crystals either falling down or liquids going up, then the chilled margin composition should reflect the integrated composition throughout that vertical profile. And I've got lots of sills where I've got heaps of geochemistry for them. And so, what I've, I'm showing you here are two examples. The one on the left here, I'm just showing two elements, zirconium and magnesium. And then these are the compositions throughout the sill. And I've integrated all these blocks to give you the bulk composition based on all those different data points. And that's what that red line is. And that's what the red line is here. What you find is for those sills that have really thick quartz dolerites, the chilled margin, that's its composition right there, is less than the bulk composition. And the magnesium composition of the chilled margin is greater than the estimated bulk composition. When you look at this sill here, that represents the ones that have less than, less than 25% quartz dolerite. the opposite. So their chilled margin has in excess zirconium than the bulk, okay? So why, what's producing that? And it's the same, this table on the right is a bit hard to see, but it's the same for all the sills that are in that right category versus the left. What's producing that? Well, I think it's lateral fractionation operates locally to, to deplete or enrich the bulk composition. So the chilled margin represents the original liquid. If you laterally fractionate, I mean, there's vertical fractionation for sure, we know that, but some component of lateral fractionation will locally either enrich it or deplete it. Now, 
So I can show that geochemically, but you think, well, let's go out in the field and let's map a sill, a long strike, and see if we can see this lateral fractionation. The best I can do for you at this point is this geological map of the cave rocks dolerite. And this is a sin form here. So it's the same sill on the east limb and the west limb. And then this is another strand. Let's just ignore that one for now. This sill here, what you can see is in purple, that's my cumulates. They stop and then they pick up again. This is the quartz dolerite in this color here. And these are all the gold loads. So what I'm arguing here is that you're finding uh, thicker quartz dolerites and the gold is associated where you don't have thick cumulates. Above the thick cumulate, that's not where you're getting the gold loads here. Okay, another way of looking at that is all the sills that I've looked at. Let's take the proportion of quartz dolerite over the total sill thickness versus the thickness of peroxynite and peridotite over the total sill thickness. And you find some interesting things. First of all, most of them are about 200 meters. You know, there are a couple that are a lot thicker and a few that are thinner, but the majority of the sills have this sort of antithetic trend where they have very thick quartz dolerites and minimal to no peroxynite peridotite, or you get those at the other end with very thick cumulates and not much quartz dolerite. These are the ones that host gold. The stars are the ones that are mineralized. If a sill is really thin, they tend not to display much fractionation at all. So there's not much quartz dolerite or much peroxynite. And I think that's quite easy to explain. You need to have a lot of heat and to cool slowly to fractionate. If it's a thin sill, it'll cool too quickly for crystals to have time to, to, to form and to separate out of the melt. So this idea of lateral fractionation, of course, is not mine. There are um, published uh, papers on this. Not a lot out there, but these two uh, kind of spoke to me. This one on the top is based on the uh, York Haven sill in the US. And what they uh, argue is that the cumulates are associated near the vent. So the olivines that crystallize early, they get dumped out near the vent. And as you move further away from the vent, the melt gets more and more evolved. And this is where the, the, the granifiers of the quartz dolerites are associated. This study is based on, uh, on the bottom panel there. This is an idea from uh, McDougall, who was studying the uh, dolerites in Tasmania. So the Australian equivalent to the Farrar dolerites, not quite as well exposed, but um, what he found what he argues is that you can see, I've colored them the same, that it's a more local feature and that you get the, the uh, cumulates in places and relative highs in the sill become traps for the more evolved components. And so he's got these sort of relative highs where that evolved liquids squeezing up into. So, taking that and thinking a bit more about how host rock impacts on sill geometry is sort of where I've tried to take it. So I showed you some beautiful pictures right at the beginning. The more, uh, the, the sort of brittle fracturing of the crust happens at deeper levels, five kilometers, three kilometers. Once you get into shallow levels, um, and particularly when you get into basins with unconsolidated sediments, you get quite different geometries. Remember I showed you those lava fingers. Um, so that's sort of encapsulated in this diagram on the left. On the right, I'm imagining a lot of those tholeitic sills are emplaced in the black flags turbidites. And a lot of them have syn depositional features. So they're telling me the sediments were unconsolidated when these sills were in place. I wonder if the gold a mile dolerite uh, being so excessively thick, and when you map it out, it actually thins out considerably, if it's a localith. Maybe you're near the vent there, I don't know. But what I imagine is there are a lot more irregularities in these sills in that lower portions act as traps for the cumulates where olivines and pyroxenes uh, 
get trapped during lateral fractionation. As magma's pushing a crystal mush along, the olivines and the pyroxenes get trapped in these lows. And that perhaps relative highs in irregularities in the, in the uh, geometry act as uh, traps for the evolved uh, portion of the sill. So kind of ideas that I can't, uh, that need a bit more study. So in conclusion, orogenic gold favors differentiated dolerites from iron rich magmas. And they're strongly associated with ones that have more than 25% quartz dolerite. Sill thickness is really important. The thicker the sill, the better potential. The gold a mile dolerite is a, a, a good example of that. They should be more than 150 meters thick. I think if they're thinner, they just cool too quickly that you won't get that evolved uh, component to them. Most of the mineralized sills, at least in the Yilgarn, are hosted <clears throat> in sediments and they're syn depositional. I think that's important because I think the geometry is very different than if you're in lithified crust. I think it allows sills to have irregular uh, upper margins and irregular bottom margins that can act as, as traps. More easily facilitates the geometries like, like Lochalis, for example. These magmas go undergo two fractionation events. And so that's what I'm showing on this left-hand tiny panel here. There's your mantle melt. It comes up into the crust and sits there and fractionates about 50% crystals, drives up uh, the iron content a little bit, reduces the magnesium content, and then it comes up into the shallow environment and fractionates again, forming this, these sills. Uh, late stage fractionation of magnetite is important for increasing the volume of this favorable host rock. You need to crystallize a lot of that magnetite and you need it to be late stage. If magnetite crystallizes early, then it's gonna be more evenly distributed and uh, unlikely to be such a good uh, host. Many of these findings are quantifiable. And so that's where I took this for the economic geology paper. Go look for sills that have high iron content. That's quite easy to do. Look for sills that are more than 150 meters thick. And then there are things you can do on the local scale if you've got the drill core. Look at the relative thickness of the quartz, uh, quartz dolerite compared to the rest of the sill. That's from field mapping or drill core logging. Um, you can do downhole geochemistry. Remember I explained about the zirconium excursions. Um, you would want relatively low magnesium. Uh, geophysical surveys, I think particularly those that, are, uh, that can target the magnetite could be helpful. There's some, there are some examples in the Yilgarn. Um, I can't remember the name of the sill they've been looking at, but they've been able to map the magnetite distribution. And I do think the, because the association of the gold hosting sills in the Yilgarn um, being in syndepositional sediments, I think that's an important uh, feature. You wanna look for sills that are in these, in these sediments or in sediments. And you can assess that looking at contact relationships or geo, having geochronology. Okay, so um, I presented some ideas that I can stand by quite firmly and then I've kind of extended that to models. I mean, what really needs to be done is have uh, case studies. I think we need to study sills um, along strike in more detail uh, to consider this lateral fractionation or the potential of multiple magma pulses. I didn't even talk about that, but of course that's something to keep in mind. And I also think it'd be very interesting to look at different compositions of sills and how that can change the crystallization order or maybe the effects of water. I do have a student that's working on this in, um, on a sill in Western Australia with Northern Star. Uh, Alyssa over here is gonna be starting her masters. And uh, this sill is really interesting because it's a very different composition. And um, these are some of the things we're gonna test there. So. Lots of people to thank, uh, but I'm happy to take any questions. That for making um, origin and gold understandable. <laughs> um, that was fantastic, thank you. Do we have any questions in the audience? Let's break.
Great talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, the it's really interesting. I, I guess a couple of a couple of questions spring to mind, and you sort of touched on it a little bit. But it, it, from what you were saying, it sounds like it should be possible to get onto some of these big sills and recognize the areas with highest potential for the secondary magnetite that you need to 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 be sulfidized at, in in the gold precipitation event using magnetics if you've got good magnetics are there any are there any sort of you know really good clear examples of that that you can see in magnetic surveys and then the second question relating to that sort of tries to push into your your set of criteria a little bit more is there something imagine that you were you know if you had a drill hole data set in one of these sills um, is there a set of of kind of, or, or are there particular aspects of the geochemistry you could use to vector yourself towards a sort of situation of having the, yep. the right kind of composition of sill to host gold? Yep. So with your first question, uh, I should just make it clear, it's the primary magnetite in that evolved portion. Okay, so it's the last gasp of melt is crystallizing the magnetite, but it does raise a, an interesting question that there is secondary magnetite. Well, when that secondary magnetite forms, if it's before orogenesis, then it should be a good host. Um, so, no, I mean, no worries. Um, okay, I'll answer the question first. So are there any good examples where they've been able to image it? So I think part of the problem is there's secondary magnetite that you have to see through and recognize and know the relative timing. Um, but the short answer is no. That there is a sill, is it Bronzewig? I can't remember in, in, in the Yandel province where they've been, all those geophysical surveys I pointed at, they've been uh, analyzing it to death. Um, but I haven't seen anything that um, I could really pull out and say, ha, ah, this is working excellent. I've proposed this as a study, hasn't gone anywhere yet, but uh, to me, it's an obvious thing to do. But I, I recognize there are complications with secondary magnetite. So your second question is, what would I recommend an explorer to, to analyze for in there and to focus on? Well, um, yeah, I think those, those geochemical uh, features, particularly zirconium, is a great indicator of the last gasp of the melt, which is, tends to be where you find most of the magnetite. But the only caveat I would add to that is, I'm just looking at the foliates, and I do think Composition, one of the uh, water is going to play in a really important role. If the magma is wet, so these tholeites are dry as. If they're wet, magnetite's going to start crystallizing earlier. And so you might have exhausted all the magnetite before that last gas where you start to crystallize zircon. So um, you've got to keep that in mind. Um, so the short answer is, yeah, I have a few geochemical indicators, but I still think we need to consider other know more about the original melt composition and, and understand the crystallization sequence before I would give a blanket run with this methodology. Anyone else in the audience? Any questions online? Um, I have a question and I'm totally going to demonstrate my ignorance of uh, origin in gold, but you've mentioned that you mentioned the word green shear facies twice. <laughs> and how important are the metamorphic facies for these deposits? Also, I guess what I'm getting at is, um, I don't know how or where I'm getting my information from, but I thought that some of the deposits up in Ilgarn are of like granulite or amphibolite facies. And like, does that matter or? Yeah. Like so what's, like what's going um, on there? The what's metamorphic gray? Yes. Your question. Yes. Um, to me, not really. It doesn't oh, matter. Cool. All right. <laughs> so what I'm trying to, you know, I want to know what that sill looked like before orogenesis. Yes. I want to know what it looked like before it was metamorphosed. Okay. So uh, unfortunately, they've experienced some metamorphism. Most of it's green schist, but in some examples, they're amphibolite. I haven't seen any granulite fasces, but mm. um, there are some examples. I wanna backstrip that. 
And that's the beauty of the geochem. And what I tried to show was that the melts modeling uh, is, is, it really describes so well what the geochemistry is showing us that I think I can see enough through the alteration in, as well. I can see the textures. I can see a relic olivine or a relic pyroxene. That's what I want to get at. That's why I'm interested in primary magnetite, for example. Luckily, it, it gets relatively well preserved, so you can, can, can still identify it. Um, so my answer would be, it's not that important from my point of view of reconstructing the sill, but in terms of orogenic gold, um, we know that orogenic gold is found from green schist facies up to granulite. So mm. um, from my point of view, it wouldn't really matter, but yeah. I'm sure some people would say, no, hold on, this is very important, but. Good, excellent. Doesn't seem like, oh, we just got a question online. Um, and it's from Karen Connors. I understand that you are focused on dollarite hosted deposits, but do you have information on the percentage of deposits hosted in dollarite versus other host rocks? This leads to the question of other important factors for explorers to consider. Yeah, so um, it's an interesting question. I know Karen spent a lot of time at St. Ives or, um, and there is this exploration bias when you have success in one type of rock, you tend to focus on it. And that was certainly the case in, in the uh, Eastern gold fields. And for a long time, there were certain rock types people avoided because no one had ever found gold there. And then of course, 10 years ago, they started finding gold. Um, but so I can tell you the statistics from 10 years ago, I'm not up to date now, but I know that it was more than 40% was in dollarites. Um, the, of course, other rock types are important. I don't mean to, to, I'm not trying to argue that we should only be looking at dollarites. What I'm trying to argue is that actually it makes a lot of sense, at least from my, in my mind, it does. And we can better target them if we understand them. Um, so I think I would just leave it at that. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you a question about Mount Isa <laughs> or about, about the Mount Isa region. <laughs> it's probably unfair, but the, uh, what, when, when you were going through, you know, when you're talking about the characteristics of the dollar, it's in the seismic, it was really interesting to see the shapes of all those things and the fact that it looked like flows and all that sort of thing. But the, the, in the Eastern succession in Mount Isa, Cannington deposit and the, the host rocks to Cannington, I think the same applies to Broken Hill are absolutely, you know, rotten with, with sills, um, you know, they're all amphibolites or various, you know, various granulites and things now, but, but, um, but it's a, um, you know, very, the sequence, the whole sequence is full of sills and there's been sort of little bits of work here and there suggesting, um, you know, suggesting changes in composition in association with the, the mineralized parts. And, and I think if I remember correctly, it's the, the more iron rich, um, sills that are spatially associated with the, uh, you know, base metal silver rich mineralization in that case. And so my question is, do you think that, that this sort of approach could be applied in that sort of, in that sort of setting um, to, to try to understand the, you know, what the relationship was between these variations in composition and, yeah. and mineralization? Yeah. Well, I certainly think any metal that's uh, being transported as a bisulfide ligand, when you get iron and those fluids, you precipitate pyrite. So you would expect to precipitate your, your other metal and probably forming uh, sulfides of interest, not just pyrite. So yes, I think iron would play an important role, but it would be dependent on that, on that bisulfide. But that's an interesting, interesting comment to think about. Yeah, I tend to get very focused on orogenic gold, um, but there's certainly lots of other deposit styles that could be related. Great.
So have there been any success stories? So you've published in the um, in the journal um, sort of criteria. Has anyone followed it and emailed um, you saying, hey, <laughs> this is what happened? Uh, I mean, I don't know. I, Damn it. I would hope someone would tell me if there, <laughs> there was certainly a lot of interest. Um, a lot of colleagues and companies have contacted me about giving talks. So um, I think, yeah, just some new ideas and, and new things to think about. So there was certainly a lot of interest, but whether or not anything materializes, well, we all know how things take a long time. So I probably have moved on by then, but um, I'm still actively working with companies. That's right. You Maybe, yeah. Develop a new theory. It was all wrong. That's yeah. great. Thanks, Pat. Really appreciate your talk. It was fascinating. Um, I guess we will wrap up at this stage, there are no more questions, no more questions online. Um, yep. So next week we have Professor Ian Satchwell, who is an adjunct professor here at SMI and who's traveling from UWA in Perth to be with us for the seminar, I guess among other things. And he will be presenting on enhancing Australia's leadership in minerals globally. We'll see everyone then. Thank you. Thank you for having me.